We know that the school year will look different across the country, but whether schools will be in person, virtual, or a hybrid approach, the learning experience will be shaped not just by the pandemic, but also by the complex and layered impacts of racial injustice, economic inequities, grief, stress, and trauma. We've heard from school, district, and state partners as they make these preparations that some of their biggest priorities are ensuring that students are supported socially and emotionally, and that teachers can connect and build supportive relationships with all of their students and each other. They wanna make sure they're responsive to the potential trauma or mental health concerns, and they also recognize the need to support each other, the teachers, the staff, and the other adults. In other words, SEL has never been more important. Today, we're gonna to share information about the new resource, Reunite, Renew, and Thrive, an SEL roadmap for reopening schools. This resource is a result of collaboration with 40 of our partners, and it's designed to help schools during this difficult transition to create a learning environment where every individual can heal and grow. We're gonna hear from how, how three districts from CASEL's Collaborating Districts Initiative are planning their implementation of these strategies to support their students and adults in the return to school. And with that, I'd like to turn it over now to Karen Van Osdale, who's CASEL's Senior Director of Practice. So we're excited today to share with you this SEL roadmap for returning to school. Um, and we will hear from these incredible district leaders that are working to bring that to life um, and to build those supportive relationships, to create equitable learning environments, and to really think about how we weave together social, emotional, and academic competence development so that we can harness those competencies and heal and thrive together. So as we think about the sort of layered challenges that Melissa just laid out, um, we know that SEL is not a panacea, but we do understand that SEL is critical to building the skills and the collective problem solving that we need to be able to move towards collective well-being together. We know that the roadmap is really anchored in a few key ideas that we'll be talking about today. One is the centrality of relationships, and we'll be talking a lot about relationships today. Also, a focus on assets and on strengths of our adults and of our young people and of our communities that we can build on in this moment. And how we can stay equity focused and centered on what is good for the collective in our schools and in our communities. And then finally, thinking more expansively about who is part of teaching and learning, what teaching and learning looks like and how that happens. Um, so really focus on that innovation, which this can be a moment for. So before we dig in, we wanna really take a moment to thank the over 40 organizations that contributed to the thinking and to the writing of this guidance. Um, and also particular thanks to our collaborating states initiative and our collaborating districts initiative leaders who played a key role in designing this. And finally, to our CASEL staff members that helped to lead this team, Nick Yoder, Justina Schlun, Claire Shu, and Pat Connor. It was a true honor to be part of this team and part of this process. So as we think about this SEL roadmap for returning to school, we just, hopefully you've had a chance to dig in, but if not, um, just to set the stage a little bit, this is really designed for schools and school leadership teams and those who support those school leadership teams. Um, we know that we are going into hybrid models, into distance learning models, and into buildings, and we hope that this guidance applies to no matter what form school is going to take in your context. And we also hope that this offers a moment to really pause and to reflect on leveraging the current moment and what we've learned about ourselves, our communities, our teachers, and our families and students to really think differently about school and what school can be with SEL and equity at the center. So what does the SEL roadmap look like? We have four critical SEL practices that we will be talking about today, and each of those has activities within it. So you will see activities that you can be doing now to prepare for our opening and activities you can be doing as you begin to implement. And I'll draw your attention in particular to some of the essential questions, which we have heard from schools and districts are really helping to kick off some really robust conversations about what do we want school to look and feel like in this coming months. Um, and we'll also call your attention to the tools. There are an incredible number of tools from partners across the country who are willing to share that will help you to really make concrete the type of planning steps that we have in the guidance. 
And finally, we want to note that this is also about sustaining this work over time. We don't see the roadmap as just something for this moment, for these next few weeks. We really see it as something that will help propel you into an effective school year and beyond in which SEL is part of that process throughout. So let's take a look at those critical practices. So the first critical practice is really about that relationship building, about building a broad coalition of people that are committed to putting SEL at the center of our work to start a new school year. The second critical practice focuses on adults. And this is something we've learned from our partnership with districts and states that you know, if we want adults to create equitable learning environments and social emotional learning for students, we've got to help create the connection and the healing for our adults themselves so that they can then carry that to our young people. And so the third critical practice is about what are we doing for students? And this includes both the types of equitable learning environments that we are building with intentionality, as well as the way we are weaving together social, emotional, and academic competency development. And then finally, critical practice four really asks us to think a little bit differently about data. And you may have heard a little bit about this at our webinar last week, but how do we look at data as a way to build relationships, as a way to share power and to really tap in more deeply to the voices of our young people and of our parents and of our teachers and staff in true partnership with one another. So we'll be excited to share what districts are thinking about that right now. And so in a moment, I'll be joined by these incredible district leaders. Um, and as we welcome them, please take a moment and just think to yourself of those critical practices. Where are you seeing strengths in your current context? And where do you really wanna lean in and listen a little bit more deeply today to get some ideas about how to prioritize different areas of work? And also, where are your questions? And with that, I will invite Katia to join me on the screen. Katia Stokes is the Director of Student Wholeness at Baltimore City Public Schools and an incredible leader who will be uh, wonderful to speak with today. Thanks for joining us, Katia. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Caroline, can you join us as well? Caroline Chase is the SEL Assistant Director with the Austin Independent School District. Caroline, thanks so much for taking time today. Well, thank you for having me. And then finally, we have Ray. Ray, please join us. Welcome, Ray. Ray Lozano is the Executive Director for School Leadership Operations in El Paso Independent School District. Ray, thanks for being with us. My pleasure, Karen. Um, so just by way of starting this conversation and um, hoping that you could share one aspiration you have for this year about the way that your community will center SEL in this planning for a new school year that you're trying to support in your current role. So Katia, can you share your thoughts with us? Yes, absolutely. Uh, for for me, the way I see SEL centering in what we do with our families, with our students, I really think of this as sort of our opportunity to come together um, and really as a community rallying around one another to ensure that not only are we thriving, but we are creating that space for healing. As we know, we have experienced a tremendous amount of challenge and tremendous amount of change. And for us here in Baltimore, we too really are also doing the work to make sure as a community, we're healing from our own current events. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I'm really looking at our work on wholeness, social emotional learning, uh, restorative practices. I'm really looking for this to be an opportunity for us to heal as a community, for us to create bridges over barriers that once existed. And quite honestly, I'm looking at it as an opportunity to just do something different. I like to say, go hard or go home, right? So here is an opportunity for us to do something different in education. All of those things that may have been things we wanted to do before, may have been nice to do's, what ifs. This is that moment of time to turn those what ifs into reality and co-construct this reality together with our families and students. Thanks, Katia. Tapping into that relationship building and that in moment for innovation. So thanks for bringing that. Caroline, how about you? 
Well, like Katia, we are um, we're really examining our own situation right now and the situation in our country and our world and really trying to bring it down to a local and immediate level. And it's it's been a wonderful opportunity for all of us in our district to reach out to our families in a way that we have um, probably not done the best job at in the past and recognizing what we're all going through and the fact that social and emotional competencies are at the core of being able to move through this really difficult time that we're in. Um, it's, it's brought us all together in a way um, as a district that I don't think we've had the opportunity that way before. Yeah. And um, we're finding that we're building a lot of collaborative relationships between the people at the district level who are doing all of the hard work of trying to figure out what is this going to look like, which is, is a, a huge challenge. Um, but we've also recognized the incredible importance of reaching out to our community and our families and bringing in our community partners to help us figure out how best to serve all of our families under the circumstances that we've been living in since March. So um, we've learned a lot along the way. We have, um, it's, it's been amazing how you can turn your your face-to-face -face world into a virtual world. And we're grateful for the technology that exists in this day and time to be able to, to really connect with people and build those relationships with people in a way that we couldn't have dreamed about just a few months ago. So um, lots of outreach to the community, trying to gather from people what they need and be able to meet every person where they are, every family where they are, and every teacher where they are. Um, and so we've done a lot of work with our district leaders this week with this tool to help us get that process started. Thanks, Caroline. We're definitely gonna hear more about that. Thank you, that's inspiring. And Ray, what's one aspiration you have for this year around centering SEL? So really my aspiration, Karen, is that SEL, we finally have an opportunity for SEL to fulfill all the potential that we've been talking about in the, in the five years that we've been working on implementing this mm -hmm. systemically. Um, there's a lot of healing, uh, as, as Katia and Caroline have mentioned, that needs to take place in, in our communities. Um, Monday actually marks the one-year anniversary since the horrific events of August the 3rd, the shooting. Um, and that, that, so 2020, from the start of last school year to, to now, has been a really traumatic time in El Paso. And so I really look forward to, to the opportunity for us to work as a school system, to work interdepartmentally, to work with our community partners, to work with our families, to really drive healing. Our kids, I think, are, are in dire need of emotional safety. Um, okay. Our teachers, our, our principals, our, just our community in general. And, and so I really think that SCL is a, is a bridge uh, to getting to that destination where we can start getting on that path to, to emotional healing and providing really um, uh, a, a deep, rich, and holistic uh, education for our students. Thank you, Ray. So let's start right there. Um, let's take a look at sort of that first critical practice that you all referenced in your comments. So thank you. So if we look at critical practice one, and this is really about that relationship building. So, and this is taking time to do it. I think it's easy to gloss over this or assume it's already there, but how do we really intentionally foster new relationships, elevate student and family voice in new ways, and ensure that it's that two-way communication um, so that we are not just communicating to, but communicating with and hearing from our partners. Um, and then taking a moment to look at, you know, schools across the country have been doing certain practices around SEL. How do we understand how those worked before we closed schools, while schools were closed? And then how do we think about, to your point, Katia, you know, what can we do differently in this moment? Um, and then just building that broad coalition that will carry us throughout the year. So we're going to dig in on these questions. Um, and Ray, maybe I'll start with you just to share a little bit around how are you tapping into the voices of families, particularly, I think people are asking about families that may not have been part of these conversations prior. What, what are you and your team doing there in El Paso? So actually, we began some of that work back in the spring, Karen. Um, we we immediately shifted into a, a mode in which we became like a social service agency, a massive social service agency. And so um, our staff in our schools 
and in our district made made tens of thousands of calls, you know, well over 100,000 calls um, to, to check in on families just to identify what those basic needs might be, to identify um, extra supports that they might need being devices, um, you know, hotspots, things of that sort. We also continue the conversation as part of our annual focus groups that we conduct with parents in the spring and just wanted to get a sense for the things that, that they needed from us as a, as a district. Um, and one of the things that they cited that, that they cited in there was just they wanted to have more of a relationship with our with our schools. They wanted to have uh, places where they can you know count on being able to come in and being part of of the school community. And so that that feedback has been incorporated into our family engagement uh, plan, which SCL is a huge part of that. We also in our department we not only do SCL but we also do family engagement. And we intertwine them and so that's been a that's we that's the that's the opportunity that that we've created and will continue to create uh, for parents to provide us with feedback we've also um, been very intentional about ensuring that we are soliciting parent input on you know what their what their needs and preferences are with respect to the return to school and so we can't obviously we can't satisfy every individual need but we've tried to be as accommodating as we possibly can and reflective of the needs of that the families have communicated to us. Thanks, Ray. And Katia, I would ask you similarly as you think about students and truly authentically partnering with students around what school can look like as we re-enter. Can you just say a little bit about what Baltimore has been doing in that regard? Yes, absolutely. So we have been partnering. We have a phenomenal uh, youth engagement specialist here in Baltimore, and we've been partnering with him, as well as our senior leadership. And so we've done a series of town halls here, making sure that there's an opportunity for students to connect with senior leadership around, here's what I think should happen, here's how I am experiencing what is happening, and here are my ideas for how we can move forward. Uh, we just recently had a town hall, I believe it was last week. Uh, and so the chief was able to share, here's our high level thinking about where we think we should go. And it was amazing to hear the students say, affirm, this sounds good, this is great, but can you think about this? And so that is truly critical as we are thinking about moving forward. You know, many of our students are really concerned about what this will look like. Will I still have some of the same experiences? You know, will I still be able to have dance and art and all of those other things that really make school come to life? How will I still be able to still keep those traditions? And so really partnering with students and having those town halls and allowing them to be able to share and have voice into not only hearing, but again, also be able to share some, some thinking and some thoughts about what should happen. We also have um, the Youth Ambassadors Program that will be starting. And this, this, I will share this because I think this is unique and it combines a bit of youth voice and not just voice, but agency, right? So making sure that students are at the table and getting able to define what is happening. And as you said, with. So this Youth Ambassador Program will be in 12 schools and they will have an opportunity to do their own uh, investigation around student engagement. And what is wonderful about this, is they get to determine the project, they're gonna go get a deep dive into continuous improvement, and they're gonna do empathy interviews at their school, they get to decide what is the project around student engagement that they wanna investigate with the intent to increase student engagement. And we know that's critical as we're moving into this virtual space, wanting to make sure we're increasing the number of students who are engaging and logging on and tapping in. So they will be facilitating this, um, these small projects and investigations at their school to help administration really think critically about how do we increase engagement and what is needed for our students to really truly log on and tap in. Uh, so I think that is a wonderful opportunity. Again, when you think about agency, empowering students with the knowledge to do the focus, through, the focus groups, the empathy and oh. the to really understand continuous improvement and then share out and give recommendations about what this can look like. I think that's a true reflection of ensuring that students are at the table at the same time that decisions are being made. I love that, Katia. And it's also a good reminder. I mean, I think we've talked a lot about, you know, what learning may have been stopped or lost at this moment, but there's so much learning that has been taking place and strengths that have been being built. So I think that's an inspiring way to think about what that can look like in a district. So thank you. Um, Caroline, I wanted to ask you, and I know Austin has done a lot of work around this. So how are you understanding 
the SEL work that your district has done and reflecting on the impact of SEL in the past years, but particularly in these past months to inform your plans for SEL in the coming months? SEL has, in the past, um, we've, we've, you know, we started focusing on kids and we realized along the way over the years that our adult piece was missing. And what we've, I think what we've really looked at over the last several months with everything that has occurred in our in our world and in our country, um, and with this with this virus and the impact that's had on our families, that our adult our adult educators, whether it's our from the superintendent all the way to uh, custodians in the building, everybody has been deeply impacted by what's going on, and we are really focused at this point on how do we take care of our adults so that they can take care of our kids. I think that is um, a critical piece of what we're doing right now. And we've been collaborating really closely with our cultural proficiency and inclusiveness team. Um, we started out with a health crisis and then we had a national crisis around race in our country. And both of those things piled on each other really have been very traumatic for all people. And we've, we've really thought a lot about how do we support the adults in our world so that they can support the kids in our world who who know what's going on but may not be able to really wrap their brains around what's happening and how they can have a voice in making change in our country. So um, we had the opportunity at our Leadership Institute this week to introduce this tool to them and give the, the administrators, we had all the administrators, uh, principals and assistant principals, we got to have them uh, on our SEL team and our CP and I got to have them as well. And the conversations that were had and the time that was set aside for those leaders to really talk about what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they're hearing from their school communities was so powerful. Um, you know, administrators don't often get to really sit and talk with each other and really share with one another their perspectives and what's going on. And one of the most powerful things we did was to have uh, Dr. Ward's team, Dr. Angela Ward, the lead for our CPNI team. They had our uh, African American principals have do a panel. Uh, elementary principals do a panel for the rest of the principals and share their experiences in our in our city as principals. Some of them as students in our school district. And I think that work, beginning with our leaders, is really going to help them to be able to um, take perspective and understand the, the importance of reaching out to their teachers and seeing where they are sitting right now with everything that's happening and what their needs are, which will in turn help our kids. So uh, we're really feeling very optimistic about the way this tool can help us really structure our practices in how do we reach out and how do we get the voices of everyone on board? And I know that we did send out surveys at the district level to teachers, to families, and to students. And the feedback we got from students was so helpful in us, on our team, being able to organize and plan for some reopening activities because we took those kids' voices into, into account fully as we tried to figure out what do they need and how are we going to help them feel safe and create that safe environment that you talked about earlier, Karen. Can I and, just, I'm sorry, yeah. Karen, can I just add in here to, to the point earlier that Caroline said just about coalition building and then just being able to hear each other's perspectives. It sounds strange for us as educators, right? To say for the first time in a sense, we're all working across like we're not working in these individual silos and we're getting it, you know, having the opportunity to actually hear. And I mean, truly hear one another. So one of the things I think has been really powerful in our reopening planning is we've done um, a series of work streams. And so we created work stream groups that have various stakeholders, principals, teachers, different um, personnel from district offices. We have work streams for like student engagement, staffing, family connections, all the different big buckets that we would have to consider for whether we are virtual or hybrid. The amazing thing about these work streams is like for the first time, all of those representatives in one space being able to hear each other's thoughts and perspectives 
really led to some deep conversation around what are the advantages and disadvantages for this particular topic from your seat, right? And so we were able to really think critically and thoughtfully about any of our plans moving forward. At the time, we were considering whether we're going virtual or hybrid. But now those work stream groups have carried on to continue. It's we started something anew. And so they are now a part of, now let's really dig in and deep into this plan. What should it look like? What are the things we need to consider? So it's really great to have all those voices at the table and at that planning. Yeah, that's such a good segue into that second critical practice, which is about adults, right? And that we have to experience this, we have to do this ourselves before we can begin to do this in classrooms or in schools as a whole. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it's that allowing that space. And I think connection is what you were all tapping into and healing among adults. And that takes time, that takes intentionality, um, ensuring we have layers of support for those who may need more support. Um, and then building those the professional learning and the opportunities for the type of innovation we need and for specifically the anti-racist teaching practice that we need in this moment and always. So let's talk about what we're doing for our districts around, for our adults. And yeah, I was gonna pass it to you first because I know you've been doing some work particularly with your principals um, around restorative practices. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that if you could. Oh, and I would love to share. So. <laughs> So we have called this our Caring for the Leader Circle, and we started this back in the spring. And originally it started off as just um, one month, and it was an opportunity to really create spaces for healing. We knew that adults were going to moving into something that was new, and we thought it was critically important that the leadership felt supported and felt supported in um, understanding how to approach it, how to have conversation, and how to structure the space, quite honestly to have the conversation with teachers. So the way we structured it is that all principals had, an, and this originally was just for the principals, uh, and principals, we had our partners, our restorative practices partners, and they, on a weekly basis, provided that healing space and healing circle for our principals to log on. And there were various opportunities throughout the day, throughout the five days, and they continued originally just for the month of May. And then there was an increased ask for us to continue it all the way to the end of June. And what we really found out of that was, it is so critical, critically important that you not just hear about restorative practices or hear about trauma informed. This is one thing to go through a bunch of slides and walk away like, yep, ready to do this. Then you go in your building and say, what? What does this look like? What am I doing? Mm -hmm. What we learned here in this experience the power of experiencing, the power of having those who are truly, truly um, versed in creating the circles, versed in asking the questions, versed in creating that safe space. It was important for principals to experience it first. When you experience something, you then can go a little deeper, right? It starts to change how you think. It starts to change how you feel. So that was truly critical. So creating that space for the, creating the leaders and building their capacity to be able to lead the work and then think about how do I create a caring space for my teachers and create this space for teachers to engage in the conversation. What that then does is create space for principals to empower teachers and give teachers that same experience and opportunity. They get to know what it feels like. And now teachers feel a little bit more comfortable right? Creating that same experience for our students. And so this has been one thing that was really successful for us uh, in the spring. We continued it on as well towards the end of the school and created healing circles and expanded healing circles for our teachers in the last few weeks of school, which was amazing and phenomenal. And as a result, we, will, we are now looking at for our opening, how do we start off the same way that we ended? Learning that it's truly important for teachers, staff, to have that space to reflect. And then those affinity groups is important as well. So teachers being able to reflect together, principals being able to reflect together. So we're gonna start off in that same way so that teachers, knowing that there's some anxiety, can really process. Thank you, Katia. And there were several questions around that, so thanks for sharing that. I think others will be able to borrow that as well. 
And Ray, how are you thinking about preparing teachers to be able to integrate SEL into instruction when we return to school? So Karen, one of the things that we've done, I think it's been an exciting development in our school is that we really accelerated our plans for academic integration uh, with, with SEL with academics. And so what, what the result has been is that we have partnered with several other departments in academics and the, so professional learning that is being designed for our teachers is being designed um, with SEL practices infused. And so they're, they're, actual, they're active learning experiences that our teachers will be experiencing. So as they're learning, let's say content, you know, key content that needs to be emphasized in this particular setting, they're also learning how to, how to infuse those SEL practices for community building. So uh, engaging, uh, engaging learning practices, having optimistic closures, things of that sort. We are using a, um, an academic integration framework from Transforming Education. And we're asking that we're really focusing on, on two of those key areas. It's, it's, this is a rapid fire learning, if you will. So we're going to really dive into just a couple of those key areas and just really try to focus on building the, the culture or the conditions for learning so that they provide that sense of emotional safety, opportunities for connection and collaboration. Ultimately, what we're shooting for in our, in our design of, of that process is that students have predictability, flexibility, connection and empowerment throughout that learning experience. And so I'm really excited about that. I think it's gonna be a really powerful opportunity and, and it, it took this to get to get us there, but we all recognize just how much um, our students need that infusion, that opportunity to, to be seen, to be valued, to be heard as part of their educational experience. And so that's, uh, that's been the main point of our development this summer. Uh, we've been training on that it's pretty much the month of July. Principals have been trained. Uh, instructional coaches will be trained this week and then teachers will be trained on that the following week. Thank you so much, Ray. Um, let's take a look at critical practice three. So this is sort of leading to what you were just talking about, Ray, and you know, what are we doing to build both the learning environment and the intentionality around building social emotional skills in tandem with academic skills. So you know, we talked about the adult to adult relationships, but how do we ensure that adults and students and every student has an adult that they are in relationship with? Um, and how do we ensure we're creating space for peer relationships, even at a distance physically or uh, <clears throat> virtually? How do we be intentional about weaving in those SEL practices and reflection opportunities into our day-to-day -day practice, be it a morning meeting or a reflection or a math lesson? Um, and then how do we build on these multi-tiered systems of support that we may have had in place, but think about what is needed now in this moment and what might be needed now for our students to feel the type of connection and belonging and agency that we talked about earlier? Um, and then how do we be intentional about really explicitly discussing the impacts of the pandemic and the impacts of racial inequity, as well as the national mobilization around that and the way youth have been leaders in that um, and build that into our curriculum day to day. Then finally, as we talked about earlier, earlier, collaborating with families and partners who have new insights into the ways that their students have learned. They've had up close and personal to see you know, what works for my student, what does not, and we need to tap into that knowledge over time. Um, and so I would love to talk a little bit about um, what this is looking like in your districts. And Caroline, maybe we can start. We've had a lot of people ask, you know, is it possible to do SEL virtually or at a distance? What does that look like? How can SEL be part of high quality distance learning? So Caroline, can you share a few thoughts on that? Sure. Um, we. Um we've been very focused on how do we integrate SEL into our academics for a long time, but this has given us a, a brand new challenge, obviously. And um, one of the things we've been really successful with in our school district is to embed the three signature practices across the board. Um, we Every meeting I go to starts with a greeting, and these are people in departments that I don't even get to interact with very often. So I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic that this is something that's become part of the culture of our district. And so we have encouraged and given lots of resources to our academic team to have them build those three signature practices into all of the lessons that are being created. They're working very hard to create six weeks worth of uh, blended learning lessons for our teachers to access. 
and those should be ready by August 10th. Um, the other thing that our team has been doing in collaboration with our cultural professionals. Just, just in case folks don't know what the signature practices are, do you want to share with them? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, I thought that was common knowledge, but I can see where it might not be. Um, <clears throat> it's part of our vernacular now. Um, it's the three signature SCL practices are having a welcoming ritual or greeting, um, having engagement strategies or opportunities for brain breaks during the lesson or a meeting for that matter, and then having an optimistic closing. And all of those things are what help really build those relationships that we've been talking about. Um, and so we're seeing them used, as I said, across our district from the boardroom all the way to the classroom and now into homes as we develop these lessons that include those. The other piece, though, is how do we help teachers to build community with their kids? And that's one of the things you asked about. So we have um, our team has put together some morning meetings at the elementary level that are designed to um, address some of the concerns that students expressed in the survey that we did and help help build those safe communities that we're talking about. And we've given teachers a lot of information about how to build virtual relationships um, and build that into their instruction as well. And as, at the secondary level, we've um, we've got circles that have been written and other activities. And the beautiful thing about the secondary work that we've done is we were able to pull in middle school and high school teachers to help us with that. And we kind of guided them through a process and 20 teachers in each group approximately, and they're producing materials that can be used with every teacher across the entire district. So that is super exciting. And I think it's really gonna help with the building of community between teachers and students. We're also encouraging um, principals to use those practices when they meet with their staff and they've been using them for quite a while. The challenge now is helping them to understand how to do that in a virtual setting as well. So those are some of the big buckets that we're, we've been working on over the last couple, couple of weeks. It's incredible, Caroline, thank you. Um, and Ray, just to get to that point, because we also had a number of questions around sort of the supports that we're building in for students. Can you say a word about how you're building layers of supports and maybe even partnering with new partners to help build supports for students in this time? Yes, I'd be happy to, Karen. So um, one of the things that we're focusing on as well is just really um, bringing to light the network of support that we have throughout our community. So we have a student care process in, in which teachers check in regularly. I, I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier checking in with their with families um, on a frequent basis and we identify basic needs that might be need to be met and so on and so forth and so we're able to connect with all, with several community partners within our within our community to help direct families to resources or connect them sometimes if we have to do it ourselves to be able to connect them with the, with those services as well um, the other thing that we're that we're looking at doing as well is um, you know just really training our, our staff to be able to recognize signs of trauma. And, and that's a little, that's much harder uh, in, a, in a virtual setting. So we're placing a heavy emphasis on, on trauma-informed practices in this, set, in this particular setting and being able to recognize those signs and then being able to identify, um, you know, the, the sources of support that we have within the district and again within the community to be able to address those needs. We're also looking at, I'm really excited about this project, uh, a check-in. Uh, that students would complete on a on a daily basis, and it measures their social emotional um, health, if you will, uh, through six dimensions. And so, particularly in secondary, when students don't communicate a whole lot uh, about what their needs are, we're if they when they check in, we're able to check in check their status over time. And if we see that a student is reporting that they are feeling down, sad, that you know, angry, frustrated, whatever, um, and we can set different benchmarks then that will allow us to respond and provide some timely intervention as opposed to, you know, sometimes you go weeks before we can identify a sign because mm -hmm. especially in secondary, they go from teacher to teacher to teacher. So this will allow us to put, you know, some type of, to be able to quantify that, if you will, to some degree, um, to identify the students that we need to provide that targeted support for in a more timely fashion. Thanks, that's powerful, right? I know, I see our panelists even taking notes, right? So I think, um, mm -hmm. Lot to learn. Katia, I think people were asking also what um, 
what could those first few weeks of school really look like for students just to be super concrete in a way that really does blend together a focus on SEL and equity and academics. Um, do you have thoughts about what the what you're hoping those first few weeks will look like in your schools? Yes, yeah, so for us, we have really taken the time to say for the first couple of weeks, really the first month, we're going to really focus in on relationships. We're going to really make sure that students have the opportunity to connect, experience what it's like to be in circle, experience what it's like to build community, um, and create those emotionally safe spaces. So one of the things that we've been doing, we have um, several of our different departments. One I will um, that's coming to mind that I'm thinking about right now is I'll Be More Me. And our Be More Me um, curriculum really looks at, it's really in social studies, but it really looks at um, student identity, which is critically important right now at this time. But then not only in, in terms of student identity, but it also helps to build with self-awareness. Um, within those first months for us, it's really critically going to be important that we are not really focused, not saying that we're not going to focus on academics. I don't want to say, and want to walk away and say in Baltimore, they're not going to focus on academics for the first month, but we really want to strike a balance, right? So we know that traditionally it has been, um, school has a lot of heavy focus on um, instruction. This time for us, we really want to make sure as we are leading up to school. So we're working with our uh, communications department to start to put together SEL videos. One of the videos that we're thinking about is self-management, right? So how do I begin to prepare for the virtual world? Logging in my, um, plugging in my laptop at night, plugging in my cell phone at night, really thinking about how do I create sort of this home fun space? In the home fun space, we're encouraging teachers, we're encouraging students to really develop a space within their home, decorate it. And then that allows for you to really get in that mood of preparing for back to school. You know, everyone is excited for back to school, get my book bag, get my materials, my supplies. That doesn't have to go away for the virtual space. You can still have a space dedicated at home. You can still set it up, decorate it nice. We're really pushing for, um, you know, put to decorate it with things that are comforting to you. Mm -hmm. decorating it with items that um, are calming. It, I call to mind one principal who has created um, sensory packages and he's mailing them home to all of the students. And so they can have them in these spaces. And we have what we call student wholeness specialists. And our student wholeness specialists have a virtual wholeness room. And it's sort of a, like a reflection room and a space where students can come do mindfulness. And so the great thing about this particular school is that particular wholeness specialist will also have the same sensory tools that the principal has mailed home to all of the students. So when students are feeling like they need a little support, maybe be feeling a little anxious or dysregulated, they can pop into that wholeness specialist room and space and they both have the same tools that they can then practice with. And that wholeness specialist can walk them through how to use that tool to breathe. Uh, so I, I, for us here, we're really trying to be really creative about making sure those first couple of weeks are focused on community building, really um, focused on the equity conversation, really focused on student identity, and really affirming that our students can do this and we are here to support them. Thank you, Katia. That's great. And I think you, know, you get at that notion. I think our roadmap really tries to ensure that folks are thinking about not SEL and academics in competition with one another, but as necessary for one another, right? So thank you for that. Um, and let's dig into critical practice four as our last critical practice. Um, so this one is about thinking differently around data, right? So how are we using data to, and we've touched on some of this, to connect with students um, as real actors in creating what our schools can look like to support educators in reflecting on and teaming with one another in new ways to reflect on their practice. And then finally, family and community engagement around these reopening plans. So I'm gonna let all of you weigh in on any of those areas that you feel you did not get to touch on already, because um, I think this is such an important piece of the work ahead. So Caroline, let's start with you. One of the things that we're doing, uh, Dr. Ward's doing in our district that we're really excited about is a collaboration with the Pacific Education Group on SOAR, which is Students Organizing Against Racism. We have that going on in a couple of our campuses, a middle school and high school campus, and it started back in the spring. 
Um, and I, I believe it's going to be expanded to other campuses, if I'm not mistaken. But it's very, it's been very powerful in that kids are being able to have the opportunity to really talk about what's going on in our world and how that's impacting them, which is then in turn informing how we are approaching what we're looking at in terms of how we're, how we're structuring lessons and how we're thinking about how to help kids build their voice in a way that is, is, is anti-racist and is capable of um, making a change in our world. So that's one thing. Another thing that we are doing with all kids is our counseling team has developed what they're calling a one minute meeting and all the counselors at all of our campuses will be reaching out to their students and doing a, a basic check-in with a number of questions that they're asking to get kind of a beat on where they are. And I think that's gonna really help us to know what do we need to, what do our structures need to look like? What does our content need to look like? And how do we organize our, um, our SEL circles or restorative practice circles or morning meetings, whatever we're doing, whatever teachers are doing to build that community to really be able to hear kids' voices and address the needs that they have on an individual level. Um, so that data is helping us um, think about what we need. And we know that their needs are gonna change over time as our situation changes over time. So we will continually revisit those conversations as things change so that we can move with that change and, um, and do what we need to do to support our kids. Thanks, Caroline. So really concrete examples that I think will be helpful to folks. Um, Ray, did anything stand out that you did not get to share around your use of data for your SEL work? Yes, um, so one of the things that we're that I'm really excited to, um, to, to put into play this year are the student focus groups. So we had done some focus groups in the in the past and I just think that in this particular setting for us it's going to be really critical to get their feedback as well after we've been in school for for a few weeks just to get the sense of how this experience is working for them and how we can take their voices into account to improve on on the quality of the experience for them so that it is responsive to the their various needs that they that they have and so that I think you know for me that's going to be a, a really neat addition um, to to our program to our to our SEL outreach because I think sometimes we forget to include the voice of the of those that are, that we're ultimately serving in the in the organization. So that's that's going to be really powerful. I also look forward to sharing some. We do uh, we we measure SEL competency growth, and so I would love to be able to look at the data with the students as well, and just to have you know have them reflect on on the the SEL implementation experience specifically and how their needs are, are or aren't being met uh, in terms of how we've structured it. This year we are having uh, SEL um, structured more, fe featured I should say, more prominently in the virtual learning experience. So I really wanna get their feedback on that and share that with our leadership so that we can, you know, take those, again, take those voices into account and adjust accordingly to better meet their needs. Great, Ray, thank you. Katia, you'll have the last word. What What are you thinking about around data that you did not get to share? No pressure, right, for the last word. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just kind of, I will kind of echo some of the sentiments of my colleagues here. We're doing the same thing, making sure we are doing our focus group with students and families to get their feedback. Of our We are partnering with our family community engagement. They do virtual tours for parents to be able to share and give feedback. Um, we're also partnering with them to do a parent university where it will be an opportunity for us to share. And I'm excited about this piece. We also are looking at having our, our restorative practices partners do a little bit around um, what does restorative practices look like in the home? Because we know our parents were, are struggling with how do I balance my schedule and my child's schedule, right? Mm -hmm. And so every now and then we might get a little heightened or it might, we might have our own little anxiety. <laughs> We know we're, we're honest, we're all adults, we can say that here. And so I'm um, really partnering with FCE and our partners around how do we build the capacity of our families to also be able to manage at home. And all of these wonderful skills that we are sharing with our students, wanting to make sure they can carry over into the home as well. And so really looking forward to just those focused conversations and that feedback from families about how did it feel to experience it in the home? What was that practice like for them at the home? I think will really, um, really help to push our work in a different direction. 
with families. Uh, the other thing that I, I really want to highlight, because sometimes I think we think about data in this big piece, I really want to want to lean into just the informal check-ins and data, um, and, and and just bring to everyone's attention uh, within the roadmap. They talk about just teacher check-ins and wellness check-ins for teachers. So often we are used to just doing the formal observations. Did you teach this? Are you on track with the scope and sequence and everything else? I really want to emphasize here that I have spoken with some principals here who are really leaning into that, really building a part of their regular routine to check in with teachers individually and creating a wellness plan and then just following up with that wellness plan. How, what is it that you need? How are you doing right now? What are you doing for self this week? How are you balancing? And so that's going to be critically important as we go into this school year, because as, some, as someone else said here first, we have to make sure we're also caring for our teachers as well so that they can care for the students. So I really wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. If we're not quite there with the larger data around things, it's OK on a school to school basis to just have those informal check ins. What I've done with my staff, and this is a quick tip, on the Android, when I do the wellness plan check-in with my team and someone might say, you know, I really want to make sure I go out and walk every day for 15 minutes. I immediately grab my cell phone and I do a pre-scheduled message and I schedule it for it to go out around the town if they want to walk and I'll send a message that says, hopefully you're enjoying that walk. Rise and shine, rise and grind, ready to go. Send me a picture <laughs> of you out on the road, right? Send me a picture of you out there. That's all just informal check-ins, informal right. data, quickly to check in. Yes, my staff is following through, but it also is building again that care and that relationship. And it goes beyond just the saying, care for self, you know, make sure you're balanced. It takes it beyond just the saying to a real reality and it's making sure it's a critical practice for everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Katia. May, may I add one little note sure. to that? Yeah. Um, I think I think that what Katia just said is a wonderful example of the leadership's responsibility to model what they want to see in their staff and what they want their staff to look for in their students. And any time, uh, and we've we've got lots of principals doing that already who are modeling getting out there and walking, just like you said, and putting their picture on Twitter and saying, "Hey, y'all." It's time to get out and move, move your body. So I, I think that it's super important to remind all of the adults how important it is for the kids to see them doing what they're asking them to do. Um, it's it's empowering and it makes it makes people feel very supported in doing things to engage in self care, which we all need right now. Absolutely. Thank you, Dana. Sure. And I think you both reference sort of this humanizing right so how are we we've all seen our full humanity in these last few months so how do we bring that into our workplaces into our classrooms so yeah incredible you're all incredible leaders i could talk to you all day long and i'm sure <laughs> there's many things you did not get to share but i know that you've given our listeners some really concrete and inspirational ways of thinking about sel in these coming months so i can't thank you enough and we do have some final thoughts that we put together to share with our listeners. So just as a reminder, and I think we touched on all of these today, that um, you know, how do we bring social, emotional, and academic development into connection with one another and not in competition? Um, and how do we recognize that there has been a spectrum of experiences, both for our adults and our young people in these past few months, and the impacts of the challenges of the pandemic, economic crisis, systemic racism are not necessarily equal, but have been experienced by all. And the growth in informal contexts and in community contexts, we also need to be recognized. So how do we bring that full picture, the full humanity into our schools? Um, we have new insights about ourselves as learners and teachers and family members, um, and we are hoping for the deep collaboration that you heard our three leaders talking about today. Um, and we also are looking at how do we adapt our systems of support? How do we be flexible in the way Ray talked about with students? And how do we create new types of learning experiences? And then finally, just a reminder that, you know, as you get a chance to look at the roadmap, it really does provide an incredible amount of resources for you, no matter what form school is taking for you this coming year. So please share your own journey with us, share your continued questions. Take a moment and think back to the critical practice you were thinking about at the beginning of our conversation and 
jot down a note about something you're going to do differently, a tool you're going to look at, you know, who you're going to call from this panel to help you, right? So, um, and you can share with us at that hashtag there as well. Um, so thank you again to Katia, Caroline, and Ray. And just as we did last week, we wanted to bring John Lewis into our space with this quote. And it says, nothing can stop the power of a committed and determined people to make a difference in our society. We stand in partnership with you in that, and we wish you the best in these coming weeks. Thank you so much for being with us.